Um, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me try to see if I can move this very quickly. Uh, we're going to try to. Um, uh, so what I'm going to try to show you is a bunch of slides, <laughs> um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, escapade as um, has been uh, uh, described. Um, maybe now we can turn the lights off. That would be um, probably better. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, contrary to what Don said, I'm actually relatively selfish, uh, and I have to acknowledge that because um, I only go to those islands uh, which are part of uh, IOTA groups I have not been able to log. So uh, to date I have 1,080, um, but uh, so the next ones uh, that I might be able to, uh, might be interested in, in, uh, in going to would have to be, uh, they're out of, uh, what do we say, about 44, 44, something like that. So they would be very uh, difficult to, uh, to, to uh, they'd be probably very challenging. Now. Of all these uh, islands, which are part of the Cook Islands, Northern and Southern group, there are eight IOTA um, uh, groups. So that means that uh, you know, the distances are very large. Just to give you an idea, between Rarotonga and Puka Puka Strait, we're talking about 1,150 kilometers. So it's, it's sufficiently, um, uh, the distances are large. So uh, Mangaya, Rarotonga, all these island groups here, Palmerston, uh, Suvarov, uh, the two islands there, Perin and Puka Puka Nasa, are the eight island groups. Uh, Puka Puka has the, um, um, I guess, identifier Oceania 98, 098, um, and um, was in demand by 92% uh, of the IOTA members. And as we know, there are many others who are not IOTA members but chase um, <laughs> islands and IOTA groups. Um, it, it was at the time uh, eighth, rank eighth among the, um, I guess, about close to 300 island groups in, uh, um, in, Austra in uh, Oceania and uh, I think 32 in the world. So it was a relatively rare one. And um, on my arrival, well, the, the, uh, one of the issues is that uh, this is not a tourist destination. Um, there's a it's a community of about 400 people, um, dropping, uh, dropped about 50% after a very large and uh, a very eventful um, um, cyclone, Percy was the name in 2005. Um, a lot of people uh, moved outside of the island at the time. But anyway, uh, it's not a tourist destination and there are no scheduled flights. So um, through the gentleman on the right-hand side, this is upon my arrival in Rarotonga, his name is Andy, familiar to many of you, he operated uh, a lot, and uh, Milan, who's the guy on the left-hand side, uh, E51 A and D, E51 DWC. Um, Andy allowed me to get in touch with um, uh, some uh, people who were important in the logistics of this event, and approximately five months prior to uh, the date of uh, my arrival in Rarotonga, I knew that one flight was exceptionally arranged by the Ministry of Education for uh, testing uh, teachers in you know, various islands, and um, the flight will, uh, will, will take me, obviously, for a certain cost, uh, which was uh, substantially higher than the cost of the trip from Canada to uh, Rarotonga, uh, to, uh, to, to, to this island. And... Um, uh, while everything was supposed to be uh, on a shoestring, um, it, it was uh, an excellent opportunity. Previous operation from this, uh, from this uh, remote group uh, was almost 23 years earlier. Um, so I said, uh, you know, we, I have to go. The gentleman in the, in the, you know, next to me is, uh, is Doug W6HB, who was at the time taking some holidays and operating as well from Rarotonga. This is Milan's, uh, since probably many of you might have worked Milan, he was very active in 80 meter, 160, you know, all modes, uh, high power. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is his, uh, his um, you know, the, the hex beam, and uh, he had a lot of <laughs> wires for 160, so the, his entire, um, um, you know, um, uh, rental uh, cot uh, no, uh, house was, um, was, uh, was, was, was uh, you know, the, the, full of beverages everywhere there. So uh, as we uh, fly in, at some point you're going to pass this little atoll which doesn't have a lagoon. Uh, its name is Nassau. It's about 63 kilometers from Puka Puka. 
and then it's a submerged atoll called Timam, about 23 kilometers. And finally, this is the landing strip on Puka Puka. Um, and I will go very quickly through some of these. There are three small islets. Um, this was very interesting. Uh, the one over there is the one that there's no people residing here or there, but that one is kept for them as a food potentially for, uh, for, a, um, for saving uh, uh, their, uh, let's say, cultures in terms of plants and things in case of a, of a, of a massive uh, problem with, um, uh, you know, that, that would worsen their, their food supplies. Um, it, but all habitants live in uh, on Waki, which is this one, here, Wale, which is, uh, which is this one here. And my operating place, you'll see it immediately, it's, it's somewhat here, uh, pretty far away from the village and, well, far away. Uh, the entire surface of uh, the inhabitant area, it's about 1.2 square kilometers. So far away is, uh, you know, hundreds of meters, but not, not really, you know. So um, <clears throat> uh, my operating spot was uh, right here. This was the place where I, where I reside. So this was um, uh, somewhat marginal, but I was approximately 15 meters from, uh, from, the, um, from, uh, from the water, as you'll, as you'll see in a, in a second. Um, <clears throat> so these um, islands, Puka Puka and uh, NASA, are also called danger islands. And the reason for that is because um, there's no access inside the lagoon and the reef extends, um, particularly at storms and, and uh, you know, under certain conditions, is very difficult to be seen. And uh, they have been a number of uh, shipwrecks, of course. Uh, the only entrance in the lagoon, uh, you can barely see it, uh, but I'll tell you where it is. It's right here, and it's been made in 1957 by the U.S. Navy at the request of the locals. So they are doing some maneuvers there. And the locals before that had to transport their traditional boats, which I'm sure some of you have seen, the kind of, uh, well, we'll show you in a figure immediately, over the, uh, over the reef in order to go and fish outside of the lagoon. There was hardly anything in the lagoon. At high tide, inside the lagoon, uh, you could get some, some um, puddles, some, some little uh, um, lakes, I think we can say, um, where even today they practice traditional fishing. The whole family would come and they will um, scare the fish in the same direction, if there's any fish. Uh, but to do some a little more serious fishing, they have to go outside the lagoon, which can't, now they can because there's a small little um, portion. But all yachts which will venture this way cannot come through that because it's not deep enough. And therefore, they will have to um, have some communication, have to anchor or probably stay adrift and, um, you know, come for supplies or something inside with, uh, with a little digging. Um, so it happened that uh, I was told that only 30 kilograms I could carry to the island. And if I have 31, something will remain in the airport. Uh, but as it turned out, and there was only room for one person, um, but as it turned out, one of the passengers didn't show up. One of the locals uh, who was supposed to fly back didn't show up. Therefore, we had one of a sudden 120 kilograms to spare. But I didn't have an amplifier because it wasn't part of the uh, design. And uh, we had about, a mini, uh, about an hour and a half. So all the other passengers ran home and brought another you know, 10, 15, 20 kilograms. I could have easily still had an amplifier, but it was, uh, yeah. So uh, here was, uh, we, we taken uh, from uh, the little uh, islet uh, we landed. Uh, of course, uh, it's a pretty remote uh, world. So. Uh, receiving, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, um, on arrival, there's some kind of a ceremonies and um, there's a little bit of a dancing and we bracing and this kind of stuff, which is kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> and this is the headquarters of the um, island administration. Um, the building to their right is this one, uh, which, which was entirely mine. Uh, this would be a, some kind of a guest house for them. Um, and uh, a kitchen, well, there was nothing in the kitchen anyway, and I wasn't to do anything, but th this was a little bit of a kitchen, bathroom, this kind of stuff. Um, this is the room, uh, well, there was a, uh, I guess, a living room, and uh, there were two, um, three uh, bedrooms. I used this one. Um, don't pay too much attention to the fan, because the noise it made made it impossible to run. And the, hot, the, the air was so hot that actually it would project the hot air right onto me. So uh, <clears throat> I tried to beam up and down and in different directions. And uh, well, I stayed with my vertical in the end. Uh, didn't, uh, 
Uh, well, beaming wasn't useful. I didn't have a beam for the... I tried to beam uh, in different directions with this, and I just, uh, as a pleasantry, uh, since I didn't have uh, an antenna, uh, you know, a directive uh, <laughs> antenna, I'm joking now about this, but it wasn't useful at all. So, um, <clears throat> um, this is, uh, uh, you know, how it looked from the sea, and we were about 15 meters from, the wa from water. At high tide, uh, the water would come over the reef, and it would be re literally, you know, 15, 20 meters from, from this at most. Uh, what I noticed was, uh, with great surprise, was that um, because in this season uh, there was a quasi-constant wind, uh, at least for, for about three quarters of my stay, uh, coming exactly from this direction, uh, a southern wind, um, I was getting some, in the air there were some thin droplets of, of, um, of water. And uh, at some point, uh, I think maybe the day before I left, a couple of days, something like that, uh, the antenna fell. And it was very well anchored. I said, hmm, it's very strange. I mean, there wasn't anything. You know. um, the amount of, uh, obviously, many of you who have been on trips and know this very well, the amount of, um, um, of, uh, of uh, oxidation due to uh, the salt and uh, uh, was unbelievable. Simply ate up, eat up, uh, it, it ate up uh, the, the connectors, and um, fair enough. Also, my headphones uh, stopped working because uh, um, you know the wires would get disconnected. Uh, th that's how much salt and humidity was in the air. Um, well, I can, I, I, I just uh, twisted them. I wasn't uh, to, we didn't, I didn't have any. Uh, serious equipment. We act I actually had a, a soldering iron, but uh, um, working with it, uh, I didn't want to take the antenna out. It was not worth it to bring it inside. And, uh, you know, uh, there just wasn't enough power to, uh, to, to do a proper connection. So I just twisted the wires and um, it worked just fine. Um, now, the first three days, well, it should have been this way. First three days, I was pretty happy. I made about 3,400 contacts. First day was 1,400. Uh, those are some good pileups. I know that it was relatively difficult for Europeans, particularly the G-stations, um, some sort of a quasi-antipode, you know, kind of a little bit of a, an antipode of this place. Uh, but three days in, uh, so I got some uh, solar perturbation, some uh, solar disturbances, uh, some solar flare hit the... Um, uh, upper atmosphere and uh, you know the charged particles uh, led to some serious problems and uh, um, some part of the day was seriously taking the rest or oh, this is just a photo in a haymac but um, just touring the island and uh, I'll, I'll, I'd like to share with you a few um, a few um, photos um, harvesting coconuts it's definitely something that I've seen for the first time uh, so they have um, you know, most of the people uh, today would have some long sticks and, uh, you know, they, they would have some hooks, some metal hooks, and they will, they will bring the coconut down and so on and so forth. Uh, then, of course, you have to husk it, and uh, it's another procedure. Um, but uh, the coconut water has a lot of electrolytes, and it's a great, great, great um, uh, source of uh, uh, hydration. Um, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed in this place to have three liters of water per day. Um, the temperature was around 33 C during the day and probably 28, 29 at night. But with 90% humidity, this was easily into the 40, 36. Um, and when there was no breeze from the, um, from the ocean, it was absolutely <laughs> unbearable. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, the guys who really know what they're doing, they still harvest the coconuts this way. And um, this is the traditional fishing I was mentioning to you about uh, at high tide. They get some um, fish and, um, um, and taro, which, which is a kind of vegetable, I guess, from the way it looks, sort of similar to, for those who haven't had the, seen it, it's sort of similar to... Um, uh, to potatoes, uh, just larger, um, and, you know, taro, and uh, I had one meal a day, which was usually served, well served, some, one of the locals brought it to me, you know, a little part of what he was eating, what his family was eating, every day around 10, 10, 30, 11 p.m. local time, 
Uh, for the rest, uh, I had, um, well, I mean, to fit everything and be all, with only 30 kilograms, it, you know, you, know you, you, you can't take a lot of uh, stuff with you. So I had one tin of either sardines or uh, some cooked, uh, some, uh, yeah, some, some uh, chicken meat or something like that. Uh, I had a, a, a jar of Nutella with biscuits um, and uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, quite honestly, that's pretty much it. I actually had uh, a, a small bag of uh, um, raisins, but uh, just to, and, and, and uh, definitely a large box. I think I had about uh, 24 or 28 um, of those protein bars, which I would, would use at night time because um, uh, they should just keep me up. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and a lot of water. Um, so this is the traditional boat, uh, which they were using right now. There were a few guys who had some of these, um, you know, um, canoes with motor canoes, but uh, traditional uh, fishing was uh, very, very much used. And you know, he's a guy who's repairing his net. And, um, this is the taro plantation. Interestingly, all the land it's obviously owned and it's partitioned for ages. Um, women do not own any piece of land, um, but they own the marshes. And the marshes is where the taro and any other things that they cultivate are. So um, regardless of which family they bring, they, they come from, which tribe they come from, um, women would pass on to their daughters, while men will pass their land to their sons. Um, <clears throat> so if you, if you get to the island and if you decide to become a resident, you will be given a, a portion of the land to use for, I don't know, whatever harvest uh, uh, coconuts or, or whatever you, you're, 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 you're pleased to do, uh, but you will never own, well, not for any foreseeable future, any land. Um, the cemeteries uh, are um, um, uh, tribal, so each family has um, a cemetery which belonged to, well, their ancestors, and they uh, clean them once a year. So the island is full of cemeteries, as you imagine, every few houses, it should be kind of a, a family, a, a tribe. You'd have, uh, I'm, I'm saying tribe by, by tribal, um, uh, by blood uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, link, not, not a form of organization. The form of organization is relatively modern. They have a city council, whatever. Um, but uh, the, 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 they, they also have a, a parallel organization with chiefs and a, a tribal council and uh, there's a super chief, actually, there's the title in English, super chief, mm. which is one of the chiefs. So he uh, will tie um, um, the, the uh, you know, if, if there's a, uh, a vote that is in limbo, he will have the final word. <clears throat> and um, interestingly, if they marry from different tribes or, you know, um, after when they die, uh, the, the, the spouses go to their tribal uh, cemeteries. They do not, uh, will not be buried uh, in the same place. Here's the school. Um, people are lovely. There are about out of 405 people or something like that on this island. There are probably about uh, 60 people or so on Nassau. Uh, here there are about 150 uh, kids at school. Um, uh, they're all uh, very eager to learn things and uh, to talk to anybody who wishes to tell them anything about the outside world. Um, a banana flower, uh, which is the first time I've seen something like that. Uh, and uh, all sorts of other beautiful flowers. Uh, these are the typical ones that um, they give you when you arrive. They, they have this um, uh, wonderful smell that um, at nighttime is released and it's just, uh, just unbelievably nice. They call this a lily and it's probably one of the most delicate flowers I've ever seen. Um, and uh, very close to, um, well, sort of north of me, um, there's a relatively large area, I would say probably about 35-40% of the island, where the locals have cottages. Now what does it mean? It means that um, this is not very close to the um, lagoon where they can put the boats on water and go to fish. Uh, this is where they come in the weekends and, uh, you know, there's always a breezy, uh, you know, weather in this area and they dance and they... Um, um, they, they make some little bonfires and, um, you know, it, it's, you know they, they, they spend the weekends together. Each um, cottage belongs to one family. And um, a typical uh, image, uh, one of the 
millions of crabs. Um, yeah, but this was not, uh, and there's no, well, I was told there's no venomous or dangerous animal on the island, or insect, bird, anything. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I do not think so. If, it, if the wind blew, if the breeze blew, that was fine. When the breeze didn't, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite terrible. I used, I had a, a one of the highest concentration of deed in, in, in any uh, anti-repellent spray that you can possibly imagine. And I used it everywhere. I, I used it on the tables. I used it on the, on, you know, on the legs, on anything. Didn't make, apparently didn't impress these guys too much. Um, this, is an, uh, this is the former hospital, um, which they continue to keep as a uh, souvenir, as a, as a mem in memory of, or, of all those who were on the island and suffered tremendous damage in 2005. This was approximately 50 meters from me. Uh, but today, through the, through the New Zealand administration, uh, which put about uh, $1.3 million, they have this shelter which is supposed to host 450 to 500 people uh, with all the food and everything else. They replace the food every so regularly, uh, probably every year. Uh, this was built in 2011, and it's uh, you know, their um, <coughs> anti-disaster um, emergency shelter. Um, well, this is how the log looks like. So we're not at 20,000. We're at 5,600 contacts. Um, uh, with 3,300 stations, which, you know, it's, uh, it's not bad for IOTA. I tried to operate as much as I could, uh, giving a chance to as many stations to, to operate. It was very difficult in Japan. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I said it previously at another meeting. I'm a firm believer that while this impetus is in people anyway, um, this uh, prestigious... Um, uh, Super League, Club Lock Super League, did unleash more of a competitiveness. And while uh, Michael very, very graciously and very carefully do not allow small IOTA expeditions to be part of the Super League operations, which is an approximate 60 operation moving window on an annual basis, as, as I'm, I'm sure that virtually all of you know, um, people have, they don't want to lose the habit. You know, you have to operate CW all the, well, as much as you can to, to always keep the training, to always be able to do that. Well, same as the Super League. You, you can't afford to have E51 LYC and not operate it on, on, on you know, 10, 12 slots uh, just because it's not part of the Super League because then it's going to be an operation and you're going to have to choose that. So you have to test your antenna, your skills, and they're just annoying. Uh, they're annoying because uh, you'd like to get more contacts with more, uh, more, more unique uh, stations and you ask for uniques and uh, they ask you, well, why can't I? Yeah, I never logged you on uh, 17 SSB. No, but you've already logged me on 10 slots. This is not the expedition intended to give you that fun. Uh, anyway, so it was a little bit of a struggle, but you see how the breakdown is. Um, the conditions, uh, particularly since I insisted to work as many Europeans as I could, 25% um, of all stations, it's not bad, in my opinion, given the conditions, although I'm sure that some in G-Land, some in UK, uh, would not be uh, still very happy about this. Um, and, but he is, just, and, and I, I usually don't put as many, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, DXCCs to, to, to give an idea. But I wanted to show you where G stands and where Europe stands and how, how, how well, I, I put quite a few. There were, there were 79 DXCCs that I was, uh, that, that were, were, were interested to log me. So, um, you know, so um, we're talking about, um, uh, 27 stations in, uh, in, uh, in England um, uh, with, for 34 QSOs, so some of them have been able obviously to do either some dupes or some uh, uh, on, on different bands. And uh, well, the GM and uh, you know, GI, EI and so on and so forth are much lower, uh, but uh, we'll give an example. So um, I obviously got a, 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 an ex ex exceptional uh, sponsorship from different uh, groups and organizations and the great support from um, a large number of individuals, individual operators, and I'm extremely grateful to them. But um, that being said, um, Japan, um, whose stations were you know, about 41% of total, 
and about 50% of the, of the contacts, uh, this time um, weren't that gracious, weren't that great, weren't that gracious. So um, uh, there was a significant um, difference overall, although quite a number of, uh, of IOTA, uh, the Japanese IOTA's uh, operator, uh, were extremely extremely supported, supportive for, for this operation. So uh, finally, uh, we, uh, it's time to say goodbyes. Um, we are refueling, and uh, unfortunately, on the flight out, um, there wasn't. There was only room for somebody. Would have been room for someone to accompany. Had, had, had somebody would have accompanied me, like another operator, would have been only room to Manihiki. Uh, from there, the the uh, the the, uh, the flight was absolutely packed. Um, um, and um, uh, these are the sponsors. And a great greet of thank you to them. Uh, that obviously includes um, and the special thanks being here today to CDXC. Um, I know that many of you and. Um, you know, thank you, Don, and um, and also the RSGB. They have a fund, which um, uh, I was uh, I'm very grateful to have been um, um, given uh, some support there, um, which they allocate for expeditions and all sorts of activities of uh, maybe smaller. Again, great thank you to these guys, and uh, this is the local uh, a photo with the local people who have been uh, quite instrumental in uh, ensuring. Uh, uh, me uh, a nice day there. Uh, this is a body who told me a lot of their legends and uh, which may maybe one day I'll write about those things. He's the island administrator. He worked for 20 years in New Zealand and decided at some point to, uh, for the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the power generation company, the New Zealand power generation company. Uh, this is the policeman who would ticket you if your um, motorbike speed is, is it's, it's, uh, higher than 20 kilometers an hour. Um, and uh, this is the uh, the mayor and one of the uh, one of the workers um, who was always asking me if everything is okay if I need anything and you know doesn't really um, didn't really want to bother anybody it was just sitting there and securing. Uh, this is the QSL card for those who might have received it. Uh, I'm not going to ask how many because I don't want to put you guys on the spot. There might have been very few <laughs> uh, of the ones present. Uh, this will, this is the story. So you know there's a little bit of a story here. And these are the very large number of individuals. Uh, I just mentioned Japan. Well, there was obviously a big, big donor there, and there's so, uh, some others. But um, just to give an idea, IOTA's, um, I'm grateful to the IOTA bunch. Uh, everyone is here, uh, even if he contributed a few tens of cents. Um, might, have, might have thrown in a dollar there, but you know, PayPal takes uh, a good chunk of that when it's just one dollar, as you know. Um, it's here. Uh, I thank them all. Um, uh, they allow me to recover a substantial amount of what I put in and uh, therefore be able to go to uh, the next one. And uh, sorry, and this is um, where you can eventually read more about it. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. I don't know. Um, This one, th this time there was no uh, arm, you know, there was no uh, uh, danger of polar bears catching me, but it, it's just far from home. Uh, there are no accommodation for anything touristical. Um, uh, don't take your spouse there. She will hate it for the rest of her life. Uh, you'll have to give up amateur radio after that. Uh, but if any questions, I don't know, am I running out yeah, of time? No, you're, you're, you're doing very well, uh, Cesar. You're, you're well within time. So if there are any questions for Cesar. So uh, the equipment is basic, uh, just 100 watts and uh, one multi-band vertical. It's a homemade vertical. Um, it, there's no traps. There's no traps. Um, you just have to go out. Uh, it will take, you have to, uh, you don't have to, uh, to, to take uh, the radials out, which are also the anchors. You just lean the, 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 the mass down and uh, you, you, you put it on the ground and you change, uh, you know, you, you switch, you put another band, you switch another, to another length, and you have a full, uh, full vertical there, and, um, yeah, sorry, Steve. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask yeah. you, what's actually, what's the area? Yeah, so the area, it's, uh, it's the same, yeah, it's, it's a homemade, it's the uh, design of, uh, I think it's DL6 uh, DW, D, DQW, uh, it's a very good friend of mine, um, he um, allowed me to do whatever changes I want, and uh, to, to, to his design, it's not, it's not a commercial design, that's my restriction, I can't, you know, put it up there. But uh, as you know, we had incurred some losses, 
when some equipment was lost at sea due to a number of reasons which I know we're not going to go now into in other operations. Uh, but I have the design and I, I can, you know, crank and uh, I can clone the antennas. Uh, it's a little bit of work, it's a, it's a little bit of a tedious work to test it, but it's just hours. You put hours, you test it and it goes. Uh, and no problem with antenna. Um, for those who tell you on a digital uh, S meter uh, that doesn't show anything other than zero, um, that at S0 on a digital S meter you cannot work, you cannot hear anything. Now go to Puka Puka. The pileup is there at zero. They'll be the European pileup, yeah. And uh, of course, uh, the, the comment which I had was a little bit nasty, and I apologize if some of you do not share the same beliefs. Uh, you know, it's okay. Uh, we all um, part of this great, um, um, you know, uh, gathering which is amateur radio. Uh, but it's very, very difficult, very easy to recognize when all the, the strongest stations in Europe come on my poor antenna rig, you know, at S3, uh, when somebody's S9 plus 40, 30 dB, almost, you know, I, well, I, I had to use actually 20 dB amp, um, uh, preamplification, uh, breaking, uh, you know, I had to almost, it was, was uh, hurting my ears. Uh, from Sierra 2 or from uh, Echo Alpha or from uh, Nine Hotel or actually from Mike Mike. Mike. Um, so there were a number of stations, not that many, I think about 10 or 12 overall. And, and I ha have, have received a lot of condemnation for this, uh, which I decided um, subjectively to pull out of the log. Actually, they are in the log, but I, I did not introduce into digital, well, they pull out of the digital log. Uh, and I decided that because the IOTA, this was an IOTA operation and the IOTA uh, program does not allow this kind of remote into a different continent, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about the rules now, but uh, that de definitely not something that, you know, I am not going to, I'll take the lead and I, I will not confirm those uh, contacts and they will disappear. I have been contacted by three of those stations, including the station from MM. And I explained the reason, and that was the end of the discussion. Nobody's ever said anything. Other, you know. Thank you. So uh, there's at least two more questions. Just take this one first. Yeah, well, it's actually two questions. First one, you mentioned about the hospital. So the tragedy in 2005, what was the tragedy? In 2005, uh, well, okay. The island has been visited um, and subjected periodically to, let's say, cataclysmic events. Allegedly... Um, well, the first visitors to the island um, seems to have been in 1595, some Spanish navigators. Uh, but the name comes from 1765 when the British expeditioners, you know, landed there. <clears throat> but sometimes in the 16th century, 17th century, uh, they seem to have had some huge tsunamis and some huge, uh, uh, as I said, catastrophic events. And their... Um, their uh, stories and their legends uh, say that only um, 14 people, including eight men and six females, uh, would have survived. And the population today, apart from some immigration from, like, I don't know, neighboring islands and this and that, comes from that. But every now and then they have some serious cataclysmic events. One of these was Cyclone Percy in 2005, which destroyed pretty much everything. As you see, everything is, um, you know, all the roofs were taken away and uh, now, you know, they, they were still built with concrete and um, corrugated metals, but it was a massive event, like, I don't know, Category 5 type storm, uh, hundreds of kilometers an hour, hundreds of kilometers an hour. So uh, a lot of people left and uh, the guys who remained uh, were substantially helped by uh, the New Zealand government to, it took them, I think, four years to pretty much uh, have everybody, provide everybody with a house, a proper house and, and this kind of stuff, yeah. And the other one was water. Does it have natural water there? Does it all from the coconuts? Um, it's a very, very interesting thing. Um, they, well, they have a lot of coconuts. Um, and uh, the idea is that if you have three liters of water, if you have to have three liters of day, minimum a liter, well, preferably two, preferably three, should be from the coconuts because of the electrolytes, given the fact that you would be losing a tremendous amount of uh, minerals. Um, <clears throat> yes, they, uh, there's no 
uh, th there's a um, treatment plant that would, uh, th that would yeah, that would, that would give you water. But I was told to not use that uh, because if I'd be local, then my body would have accustomed to whatever they put into it and other potential things that may exist. So I actually um, uh, brought some water with me. Yeah. February 2005, my question followed on from the one you just had about the cyclone. Um, there was Cyclone Mina, Nancy, Olaf, Percy and Rhea. There was five cyclones in five weeks. And I was on Itataki at the time. And I was trying to get up to Banahiki. And Aero Rotondo had sent all the aircraft up to Fiji. So I couldn't get up to Manahiki, which was a shame. So you can spend, you can spend a year planning an expedition but if you've got a, um, a serious storm like that, luckily on the island I was on, nobody was killed. So I should imagine on that, where they've got a very primitive lifestyle, I think they suffered a lot more damage. Um, I think you're absolutely right. But, um, you know, for, for those who are willing to put a lot of time, and sometimes this is not really on our agenda, this actually can create some opportunity. Um, when we, we did that operation from, um, in January 2016 from um, Antipodes, Zulu Lima 9 Alpha, um, the Department of Conservation of New Zealand was supposed to undertake a last trip to, to, to repair the, shad, the shacks they have there and on, on a, on a, in, in view of a, some mouse eradication, bigger pro, big project they would have to start in, uh, in May. And one trip was absolutely necessary. And um, the, um, the Department of Conservation had been um, uh, given, uh, had been put in touch, and you know, uh, there was uh, some, uh, the, the Navy ship Canterbury, New Zealand Navy ship, Her Majesty uh, um, ship Canterbury, was supposed to doing this trip. But Canterbury got um, 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 a, a, um, 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 a mission for um, a relief a release mission for, uh, for for some islands in Fiji in the Fiji chain some somewhere in the, the Fiji Islands and they were totally not able to do it and these guys from the Department of Conservation so keep in touch with them um, they, we were hovering around them for a long 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 time so well listen there might be a tiny little opportunity here but you know I'm not I don't think that you'd be willing to spend the money um, and the opportunity was that well we'll have to get a, a yacht to take us there anyway. If we could take a bigger yacht instead of carrying two people, which was the initial thing, plan, to take six of them and say, well, if we take six of them, then we have to come four of us because we need two stations. Uh, and, and this is how, in the end, Antipodes was broken because they had, I mean, was uh, the, 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 uh, the, the possibility which, the, the, you know, forbidding us to operate, forbidding anybody to, to travel to Antipodes had been... Um, uh, you know, we, we've been, we, we received this, uh, you know, uh, an exceptional uh, uh, permit to, to land there because we were helping them. So we actually provided them with a, a timing operation. Um, and yeah, it cost a lot of money, but, you know, we recovered a lot from the, from the people. So hover around them. <laughs> you may not get what you want, but you may get where you've never thought. And it might just be fun. Can I just ask you one last question, uh, Cesar, on, on your operating strategy? Because E5 North Cooks is quite an interesting one because it is a rare DXCC as well as being a rare IOTA. And that, I think, is why you will get some people chasing you on a number of bands, um, although it's not necessary purely for the IOTA award. Mm. And I just wondered, given that you operated on pretty much every band and, and, and on more than one mode, why you decided to do that rather than, say, focus on, on just a couple of bands? I actually focused on um, the first day, uh, the first three days, I pretty much worked only on 20 and 30 meters. Uh, that was where I hoped to find the most Europeans, if any. And uh, there was good in North America and obviously Japan had no problem. So I only worked those bands. Um, well, well, I had to change uh, to 30 meters in the middle of the night. 20 meters was closed at some point. But as, the, uh, as we progressed um, and as the, uh, some of the bands would be virtually dead uh, to any reasonable distance except at night time to North America, um, and uh, yeah, very, very early in the mornings to, uh, which was actually my, uh, my evening, uh, kind of gray lines to, um, 
to, uh, to Europe, um, well, uh, I had to please a little bit the JAs. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, we, we're getting, um, I, I was um, having a daily uh, um, SCAD with E51 A and D, who was in touch with my uh, pilot. And um, the pilot station would be receiving different messages. For those from Japan, is that, well, don't work just the high power stations, the hogs. They're going to work on every band, every slot, and so on and so forth. So uh, every now and then I was hoping that maybe low power will help them. Um, but, you know, Japan was pretty much, uh, well, it's not just Japan when I say Japan, but actually all the Southeast Asia, Far East Asia. Uh, they were coming very nicely. There's a lot of stations from China and a lot of stations from Korea as well. But, um, yeah, at some point, uh, some of the guys in Japan would ask you, can you go 10 meters? Uh, and I would go 10 meters. But then he would say, okay, well, can you also do 10 meters SSB? No. Uh, or, you know, some of that. So um, we try to maximize, but, uh, you know, we have to please, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't really like the fact that um, when I was, was indicating to Japan that I want only new stations from Japan, only new ones, um, you know, there were guys who were still chatting, why don't I want to work them? And they were ninth or 10th or maybe even 11th uh, slot. Okay. That was a little bit hard taken. But, uh, and it's sometimes just if they, wouldn't, uh, if they wouldn't continue to stop after a few minutes of me constantly asking this, I would just shut down for 10 minutes and then I would come back and <laughs> eventually some of them would be gone. So. Thank you for that. And we'll, we'll wrap it up now. Cesar will be Thank around. You. Cesar, I should have said, is very much involved in the management of the new style uh, IOTA program, the, the, the new management regime. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that. Is it this afternoon? Um, uh, yeah, 1.30. 1.30 uh, <laughs> uh, with room, Roger. Room two. Room two. And uh, I guess Roger and Cesar and others will be there. Well, look at your program. Or anyway. three, yeah. <laughs> room three. Look at the program. It could so, be room um, three. So can we just uh, thank, thank, uh, thank Cesar for his talk? And thank you guys for all the support.